let me take you by the hand and lead you through the streets of London. I'll show you something to make you change your mind. Pip, pip, tally ho, Jules Guides here, in which I wander around London and tell you fascinating facts. And uh, people often say to me, Julesy, oh Julesy, just why don't you do some sort of challenge, a treasure hunt? So I'm going to go around London, point out some of my obsessions, like post boxes and cattle troughs and stuff. And if you spot them, I'll award you two points. And if you're paying a visit to London at some point, you can take a photograph of yourself in front of it and, uh, and share it on Instagram. And remember to hashtag Jules Guides. The person who gets the most will win. Our very best wishes, Joe. Of course. Oh, <laughs> I nicked that off Danny Baker. No, there's no prize. It's just our best wishes. But uh, for example, look, come over here. Follow me over quick whilst it's um, like, oh, don't get killed. Over here, take for example, this fountain over here. This is the first drinking fountain in London. Back in the 1850s, that was the time of raw sewage floating down the Thames and old Jon Snow having to remove the handle off the pump in Soho because of the cholera epidemic. This fella, Sam Gurney, he came along in 1857 and installed the first drinking fountain in London for the Metropolitan Drinking Fountain Association. Funnily enough, drinking beer in those days was actually safer than drinking water. So they came up with the idea of putting a lot of these fountains, drinking fountains, quite near pubs and this is actually the oldest one look at that fancy a drink joe oh yeah sounds great mate yeah lovely uh, I don't like spiders so he can get his own pint it's amazing that about seven thousand people a day used this it's hardly surprising because uh, that after they brought the hangings down from tyburn gallows up in marble arch they brought the public hangings down here to newgate prison but people were actually hanged out here in the streets and in 1868 the last public hanging, to give you some idea, 20,000 people came by tube, the newly built tube. All those people probably wanted a drink of water and it would have been quite popular and probably needed some sanitizer on these cups. Rather delightful that, don't you think? And in 1867, they decided, why are we only providing water for the humans? What about all the horses and the cattle? So they decided to add cattle troughs into it with the snappily titled, Metropolitan Drinking Fountain and Cattle Trough Association. So if you see a fountain anywhere in London or a cattle trough that says Metropolitan Drinking Fountain and Cattle Trough Association anywhere on it, I will award you two points. They're always in memory of somebody that you haven't really heard of. I'm sure someone has heard of them. It's a bit like these days you have park benches to remember people, people who don't have gravestones or something. I mean, no one really remembers who these guys are. That's the thing. I've got no idea who that, who that guy is. <laughs> Language, Timothy. If you happen to see one of these actually being used for its original purpose, i.e. buy horses drinking out of it, then I will award you double points. And it's also the perfect venue for the old walking down the stairs routine. Have you seen the old man in a pose <laughs> down the market? Kicking up the papers with his worn out shoes. Many apologies if you've seen some of these things in my other videos already, but um, I just thought it'd be fun. Look, here for example, look, these are a typical Jules Guides item. Look, parish boundary markers. These marked the edge of the local parish. Look at this, this is supposed to be an anchor. Okay, it's pretty old. I mean, this must be a really old one. This, this one is an anchor and it would say SDC on it. And that indicates that it's the parish of St. Clement Danes, which is the church over there. And St. Clement, I think he drowned with an anchor tied around his ankles or something. That's why he's represented by an anchor. And this one here is um, St. Dunstan in the West, SDW and that's the parish back in that direction. And if you see any parish boundary markers, you will also get two points, but sometimes you see them high up. They're not only stone ones, these are particularly nice, but some of the newer ones are actually high up and marked on the wall, as we shall see. In his eyes you see no pride, and how loose the at his side. Yesterday's papers tell him yesterday's... This is Devereux Court, but look, you can also get these ones high up, like that one up there, you see? Now that's a proper one, you can actually see the anchor there. Supporting artists are ready here. Do you know that St. Clement was drowned with an anchor tied around his ankles? No, there you go. See, that's the sort of stuff, the kind of gems you learn on Jules, guys. And the one on the right is not a parish boundary marker. The, the one on the right is actually a property sort of stamp marker. It, that indicates that the person who owns that building is the Duchy of Lancaster. And the Duchy of Lancaster is... 
queen. The queen, the queen, the queen is the duchy. Oh, the queen is the head of it. So it's like a portfolio for like, God, which looks like their estate. It dates back to the War of the Roses. It's an ancient dukedom. Anyway, if you're the head of the Duchy of Lancaster, your title is the Duke of Lancaster. And sometimes when they introduce the Queen, they introduce her as the Duke of Lancaster. It's very weird. Anyway, look, Robert Devereux used to have a house here. For these all inns of corn, chambers and what have you, he was the Earl of Essex. And if you've seen that film, Elizabeth and Essex, he's the one who was having a bit of how's your father with Queen Elizabeth I. And he ended up plotting against her, trying to overthrow her. And um, she had his head chopped off. So anyway, yeah, around 1670, some builder came along who had the rather excellent name, Nicholas, if Christ had not died for thee, thou hadst been damned, Barbon. He came along and he knocked it all down. Back in the um, 17th century, it was very uh, fashionable to have these long puritanical names like that. Quite a lot of people had them. Anyway, two points if you spot the boundary markers, and two points if you spot these property markers. You can enjoy your champagne. We are out of here. Let's go. <laughs> Have a lovely so drink. How See you later. Can you tell me you lonely and say for you that your sun don't shine? Excellent double points on offer. Fire insurance plaques. Look. You see these things? So there's that one up there. Look, try not to film inside someone's actual bedroom window. And look at this one over here, look. That's the Sun Fire Office from 1710. That's the oldest insurance company in the world that's still in business. Basically, if you had your house burning back in the 1700s and uh, you didn't have one of these fire insurance plaques out on your building, um, then they wouldn't put the fire out. You had to have paid for your fire insurance. Back then it was the Sun Fire Office, but that went on to become Sun Alliance which is the famous insurance company today, which I think it's now turned into something else. So, is this a sponsored video? Because they mention a lot. <laughs> no, that was a good thinking, actually. They should be sponsoring me. Yeah, exactly. I don't know who called the fire brigade. How did you call them? You couldn't get on the phone. phone, I guess. Just have to run down the street well, shouting fire, I suppose. Well, 1710 is when it was founded in the 18th century, I guess. Quite a few of them started popping up, some of these other ones with different companies. Oh, but I love fire insurance plaques, so if you see them, you get double points. Four points for spotting a fire insurance plaque. Points. What are points, mate? <laughs> well, sponsorship deals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let me take you by the hand and lead you through the streets of London. I'll show you something. Excellent! Look, my favourite objects. Everyone who watches Jules Guides knows that I've got a bit of an obsession with post boxes. This particular one was put here in the time of King Edward VII. You can tell because it says ER7. That's uh, Edward Rex as in King the Seventh. In the old days, before post boxes, you used to just go down to the local postmaster or something and get a stamp and you'd have to leave it with him. The first post boxes were actually invented by the writer Anthony Trollope in 1852. He, he worked for the post office or something and he went over to the Channel Islands. It was a problem. They had problems with the timetables of the ships or something. And he said, well, how about having some post boxes? Some of the early ones were green, actually. But they thought that green ones would be, you know, less obtrusive and not get in the way, but unfortunately they're a little bit too unobtrusive and uh, people couldn't see them. They just blended in with the trees and stuff and people just ignored them. So later on in 1874 they decided to paint them red. You don't get any points for Queen Elizabeth II, ER2. No points for that, they're rubbish. But if you see Edward VII, Queen Victoria, VR, Victoria Vagina, I mean Victoria Regina, King George V says GR and King George VI, those are quite rare. I will award you two points. But if you see one of these bad boys, then I'm offering a whopping 10 points because this is a King Edward VIII post box. And I'm not telling you where it is, it's a secret, but I have left some clues for you to find it. And I'm really annoyed because when I made my Brixton video, I forgot to mention the King Edward VIII post box there, but he wasn't on the throne for very long. He was the one who abdicated in the 1930s in order to marry Wallace Simpson. And I mistook it, I saw ER, and I just immediately thought that it meant Elizabeth Regina, honestly. A pox on me for a bumbling fool. I never knew you were such a post box geek. So how many am I looking for? If you see two of the same type, you don't get two points for, for, for each one. But if you see one of each different type, then you get two points for each of those. So it's like letterbox bingo. Yeah. Amazing. Yes. Like top trumps. Letterbox top trumps. I should make some merch. Jules Guide's top trumps merch. <laughs> Come on.
The idea isn't that you're supposed to walk around London searching for these things. It's just that if you happen to be wandering around and you spot them, I think it's nice. Just make a little note of it. Take a photograph of yourself. Sort of share it on Instagram. Hashtag Jules Guys. I'm definitely going to do that. <laughs> Have you seen the old girl who walks the streets of London? You know, if you actually, because of the sun, we're having to put my hat back like that. Apparently, if you wear your hat back on the head, it means you're available. Oh. See, down, down like that, apparently means that you're not available. But that means I'm a dandy who is available. Is that why everybody's <laughs> whistling at you? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> oh, now down here is something that I will also award two points for. Look, now you're probably wondering, because <laughs> down here, do you know what these are, Joe? What? These are urine deflectors. Okay, so if you're a bit wasted in the evening after stumbling out of the pub and you sort of can't find anywhere to go to the toilet, you, you, you might unzip your fly here and go for a waz against this wall. But of course, this will cause your urine to drip back and hit you on the shoes. So the idea of it is to stop people from relieving themselves in these alleyways. These ones, I believe, are Victorian. But if you see these anywhere, first, don't have a waz. And secondly, I will award you two points. She's got no time for talking. She just keeps her right on walking. Carrying the home it's you carry a van. Joe, thou hast saved me a thousand marks in links and torches, walking with thee in the night twixt tavern and tavern. Okay, what does that actually mean? <laughs> it's Henry the Fourth, Part One. In fact, whenever you quote Henry the Fourth, Part One, it's always full staff. Well, he's talking about links. Now look. You see these things here look like kind of upside down trumpets. These were used by link boys and a link boy was someone who in the 18th century before street lamps, he'd show a, a lady the way home with his torch. He'd light the way home in the middle of the night so she could arrive back safely. Except sometimes if she wasn't careful, he might lead them down some dark alley uh, to where his mates are hanging around and then they'd duff her up and nick her wallet. When they arrived here, they'd have this lit torch, burning flame and they'd just think, well, rather than use it all up or my wax and whatever they were using, they would snuff it out on the little snuffer here. And they're rather good if you see one of these around. Two points, I think, for one of these. I'd, I'd rather like them. The lamp holders as well up here, so this would have been full of, say, whale oil or something like that, and they'd burn, they'd burn outside your property. So at least your house would be lit up on the outside. Now, over to Vintage Jewels to tell you about stretcher railings. Two points if you spot these. These are World War II stretchers. These were used right, by the ARP, which is Air Raid Precautions, in, during World War II, because a lot of the metal had been removed from uh, a lot of the houses and everything to, to be uh, used for the war effort. And um, in order to make stretchers to help people who had been uh, bombed by the Germans, terrible, bad, hun, dreadful people, the British, splendid fellows, marvellous, great, wonderful, first-class chaps, they uh, designed these stretchers. Um, they made 600,000 of them. And the reason why they're made out of metal is that in case of an evil gas attack, then the stretcher could be sterilised more easily. And after the war, because all the metal had been removed from all the buildings and everything, they didn't have much metal left. Using true resourcefulness, they decided to use these stretchers as railings around some of the housing estates around South London. And uh, these ones are still in operation. How can you tell me you lonely and say for you that you now, if you've seen my video about Stoke Newington, you'll know all about my new obsession with coal hole covers. It's all Amir's fault. These are Victorian coal hole covers, so when you needed your coal delivered, you would pop underneath, you would open it, the coal merchant, rather than going in with a sack and yeah. basically making a mess of everything, they would just empty the sack <laughs> all the way down into the chute. Coho covers are either purely ornate and decorative and there's no writing. And if you do see the writing, like this one, it's either the foundry, where it was cast, right. or it's the ironmonger that sold it. And some of them are really quite beautiful, actually. I particularly like this one here because it says uh, T. Sampson Limited, Euston Road, NW, instead of NW1. That must mean that this predates 1917 because it was in 1917 that they introduced the numeric subdivision into the postal codes. Um, so this was just NW instead of being NW1, which is rather nerdy and um, pleasing for me. <laughs> You've got the solid ones, You've got the ones with uh, ventilation holes and you've got the ones with pieces of glass. Oh, you see? That probably used to be glass and they filled it in. Probably high maintenance as well when they break. 
it was almost a status symbol. If you had a fairly mundane little Hayward and I had the nice sun design uh, produced by Clark Hunt, apparently I have more money. So if you spot one of these, award yourself two points. But if you see one with Clark Hunt written on it, you get double points because his name amuses me. In the all night cafe at a quarter past eleven, same old man sitting there on his Excellent own. look! By added coincidence and bonus, you've got one of these original gas lamps here. I love these old gas lamps. It makes me feel like I'm really Dickensian and living in the time of Oliver Twist, which probably wouldn't have been that pleasurable, actually, now I come to think of it. But... <laughs> Gas lamps. I mean, who uses gas? Yeah, I think they probably they are, and the gas board have to come and um, oh. come and tweak them every now and again. That little round thing inside it—that's a kind of timer mechanism. You get them dotted around London in certain areas. I'm not going to tell you where. You've probably seen them in Jules guides before. But yeah, if you spot a gas lamp, give yourself two points. Why not? But it has to be a real one, not one of these imitation ones like the ones they've got in Primrose Hill. Okay, I'll tell you. This is. Tavistock Street. I don't want to give away where all these things are, but uh, this is quite important. This is, they say this is the oldest street sign in London. Just above there where Thomas Quincy used to live, who wrote Confessions of an English Opium Eater, it says York Street, 1636. It used to be called York Street. And I'll offer double points if you spot an old Stone Street sign because there's various types. And there's also two points for these pre-1917 ones, which doesn't have the numeric postcode on it, like just says N or NW, etc. Did that make any sense at all to you? That was a lot of talking about the street sign. When I add in some pictures, I think you'll understand what I'm talking about. If you don't, who cares? It's just for fun. You don't get any points for spotting one of the noses of Soho, though. That's for a different day. What a load of bollards. Bollards come in all different shapes and sizes, but in the 19th century, it became popular to use disused cannons as bollards. Could have been captured at Waterloo, this. Probably killed people. You'll get two points if you spot one of these excellent, authentic cannons. You can tell that these ones are real because they're all different sizes. This is a real cannon. They come in fat ones, skinny ones, upside down ones. The idea is that there's a cannonball lodged inside the top of it. Later on, they decided to use that design as a kind of replica. That's why you get these other bollards, which are kind of the same shape in a way. This is possibly a French cannon or maybe Spanish, probably English actually. But if you want to earn double points, you've got to find one of these, which is a cannon with the cannonball dislodged. I don't know what happened to the ball. Now it's just turned into a sort of ashtray or something. La 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 la. Two points, street furniture. La la la, how interesting. Looking at the world over the rim of his teacup, and he's still last an hour. Get yeah, milestones like this one over here. This is excellent. I like this because it's one of the older stone ones. What with the invention of cars and motorized vehicles and everything, road signs started to cause milestones to die out. Four miles from the post office, which I think is the one up in um, near St. Paul's in Postman's Park. See my excellent video about Watts Memorial. Some of the newer ones are made out of metal, but you still get two points if you spot either of them. And they're not to be mistaken for parish boundary markers. What about those stink pipes, Jules? Oh yeah, I forgot stink pipes. How vintage Jules can tell them about stink pipes. You know what this is? This is a stink pole. Now, around the middle of the 19th century, we had something called the Great Stink, which was where the sewers were overflowing and the rivers were disgusting and full of detritus and smelly feces. Sometimes the sewers would even explode. The one down like, near the Fleet River, um, there was actually an explosion there near King's Cross. So when they developed the Victorian sewage system in the 1850s, they installed a whole bunch of these stink pipes. So actually what they are is uh, ventilation shafts for uh, to let out all the smelly, pooey fumes from the sewers and also to release pressure so that they've got no smelly explosions. And it took the smelly fumes all the way from the sewers all the way out and delivered them over above the heads of the Victorian public. I call them pongy poles. Some of them are actually really beautiful and ornate, like the one down in Kennington Cross is quite a famous one, but uh, many people might just walk past this and not notice it. They probably just think it's a lamppost. A remnant of Victorian England. I dare say if you light a match at the top of one, you'd probably get a flame. I just want to say that I do not recommend lighting your own farts, by the way. I mean, you can if you like, but uh, I take no responsibility for the consequences. Aww. Yes, two points for spotting a stink can you pipe. Tell me you're lonely, and don't 
Cheers, Joe. Cheers. 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 Thanks, everybody. Thanks for watching. If you enjoy my videos, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you're coming to London, don't forget to play the Jules Guide Street Paraphernalia Challenge. We'll see you next time, folks. Don't forget to share it on Instagram. Cheers. Let me take you by the hand and lead you through the streets of London. I'll show you something.